Well, hey there, guys, and welcome to Collider Mailbag, the all mailbag show here on Collider Video, where all we do is obviously take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campia. I am the senior producer over here at Collider Video, and I am so glad you decided to make me a part of your Saturday or whenever you happen to be watching uh, this video. Uh, this is the show really where, uh, like I said earlier, we just take your mailbag questions, but this is also a very laid back show. Uh, we'll talk some behind the scenes stuff. It's a lot more casual. It's a lot more informal. Um, and even on this show, we now will take TV questions. Now, a lot of you guys, we didn't get a lot of TV questions this week. I think it's going to take a little while for the word to get around that on the weekend mailbag shows. We're actually going to be taking TV questions. Um, so we're excited about that. And listen, hey, if you haven't heard yet, we are about to get into TV in a big way. We are uh, next week. We are starting our recap show network and we are covering six tv shows we're going to have recap shows or after shows for six tv shows um, and if those go well and if we think we're doing pretty good at it and if we think you guys are watching and you guys are enjoying it then we'll expand that to a lot more shows and the shows that we are starting with are blacklist empire uh, arrow flash agents of shield and supergirl and uh, i'm really excited about that and we had like over a thousand um applications come in for people who wanted to be hosts on those various shows and we have now selected our casts we have them in place i'm going to share the casts of each and every one of those shows with you guys probably on monday's show uh, on monday's movie talk that is and i'm really excited that we're going to get started on that i hope you guys will join us and uh, be a part of it and give us your feedback as we go so i'm pretty stoked about it Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's get started. Oh, you know, before we get to the first question, I should remind you guys that if you have a topic or a question you'd like addressed here on Saturday or Sunday's mailbag, or maybe even on the Monday through Friday movie talk, just send your question on in anytime, 24-7 to collidervideo at gmail.com. You can see the email address right there. Send your question on in. Now, look, remember, we get over a thousand questions every week. We only have time to answer about 30 or 40 of them. So please understand it's nothing personal if we don't get to yours, but send your question in and see if you, uh, see if you can get yours on like these few people were about to go through their questions did. So with that said, now let's get to the first question of the day. And the first question today comes to us from Jordan O'Donovan, who writes, if you had to bet money on it, do you think the title for Star Wars Episode Eight, since it starts shooting this month, will come out before the release of The Force Awakens or a short time after its release? Personally, I would rather get the title of the next movie at the end of the credits, like at the end of Back to the Future movie, for example, rather than footage for Rogue One, as I think it would play better into story continuity rather than have it released for chronological order and as a marketing strategy and keep the anthology films as their own thing. Would love to hear your thoughts. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Jordan. And you bring up something that we addressed on a movie talk the other day. So like, or maybe it was Jedi council that we covered it. But anyway, we talked recently about, you know, do we think there's going to be an end credits? Do we think with the star Wars film, since they're now having a star Wars film come out one every year. And, you know, in a couple of weeks, once star Wars episode eight starts shooting, this will be the first time in history that three star Wars films will be in production. We'll have Star Wars Episode Seven that's still finishing up all of its post-production stuff. We'll have Star Wars Rogue One, which is already shooting as we speak. And we'll have Star Wars Episode Eight. we'll have begun shooting. It'll be the first time ever that we've had three Star Wars films in production at once. And anyway, the question came up is, do we think there's going to be a post credit scene? And our thoughts were, yes, there will be. And it will be for Rogue One. Because it's what makes most sense. Rogue One is the next film coming out. It is the next movie. And they will have more done with Rogue One, obviously, than with um, Star Wars Episode Eight at the time. Now, for those of you who don't know, if you don't follow Star Wars really close, you don't know how all this works. There are basically two sets of Star Wars movies now. There's the Star Wars episodes, so there's going to be Star Wars Episode Seven coming out, then Star Wars Episode Eight in two years, and then Star Wars Episode Nine two years after that. And that's the one continuous story. Also, there are these things called Star Wars anthology films, they're calling them. And the first anthology film is Star Wars Rogue One. Now, these all happen within the same Star Wars universe, 
but they tell different stories outside of the main storyline. So, for instance, Star Wars Rogue One is going to be about that first group of rebels that stole the Death Star plans from the original Death Star. Now, remember, the first Star Wars movie starts with Princess Leia, R2-D2 and everything, trying to get the plans to the Death Star to Princess Leia. That's, that's the point of the movie. Well, Star Wars Rogue One tells the story about how those plans got stolen in the first place. Then Star Wars, the second anthology movie, uh, is going to be a Han Solo movie. So you have the episode movies that are happening over two years, and then anthology or one-shot stories that happen within the same universe, just outside of the main storyline, that will also happen every two years. And so what Jordan is kind of suggesting is, well, you know, when episode seven starts, just stick with the episodes. Don't give us a post credit scene with, you know... Um, with Rogue One, give us a post credit scene for episode eight because that's the continuous storyline. And I understand that logic, I do, but I have to respectfully disagree with you. I think it makes the absolute most sense that you show a post credit scene involving Rogue One. It is not going to confuse the audience. The audience are not morons. Um, you're, it's just going to, you know, they have a little thing one year before Star Wars episode four or one year, you know, or 20 years before this or 40 years before earlier you know they'll have that sort of thing and then give us a post credit scene that leads into um rogue one now just like i had to just explain that there are two kinds of sets of star wars movies right now with star wars the episodes and star wars the anthologies i think this is a terrific opportunity for lucasfilm and disney to put that on everybody's radar to put that movie on everybody's radar and get everybody talking about that next movie because that one's coming out in a year, not in two years. And then Star Wars Rogue One can then use its post credit scene to promote, uh, to pump up and give us a glimpse of Star Wars Episode Eight. Now, the idea of just use the post credit scene to reveal a title, to be honest with you, that does nothing for me personally. That's just me. That's just my opinion. Um, it does absolutely nothing for me. It, it seems kind of pointless and useless. And you can just drop um, the title online anytime you want. And then, because if you're saying, oh, no, it'd be great to be in theater and then see it revealed at the end. Well, that's great. But in the modern age, that's only going to be good for the first people seeing the first screening. Because once the first people see the first screening, that title is going to be all over Twitter, all over Facebook, everywhere. And so 90% of the people aren't going to get the oomph of the post credit scene if the post credit scene is just revealing the title for the next movie. So I don't see revealing the title as a big enough deal to use your post credit scene for. But like, but you obviously do, and maybe there's some other people who do as well. I totally respect that. I'm just saying... Not for me. I don't think it makes much sense. And I really do hope personally that they do a post credit scene showing and giving us a glimpse at Rogue One. All right. Thanks a lot for the question, Jordan. Let's move on to the next one. And the next question today comes to us from Richard Pease, who writes, I've been watching your show for a long time now. Every day I can. Well, thank you so much, Richard. Um, recently, you guys talked about how Ben Affleck will likely be directing the next DC Batman movies. This brought me back to a question that I have had for a while, but never bothered to check into. How does an actor of a movie also direct a movie? Do they have a temporary director for their own scenes? Are they constantly going back and forth from acting a scene to rewatching it to see what needs adjusting? Is there no, or is there no set way to do it? Well, thanks a lot for the question. Now, the first thing we should point out here, Richard, is that, yeah, you're hearing us and a lot of other people talking about how the presumption right now is that Ben Affleck, who is one of the best directors in Hollywood right now, um, not the best, but one of the best, that the presumption right now going around a lot of places, including here at Movie Talk, is that Ben Affleck will be directing the standalone Batman films. Ben Affleck has, like I said, one of the most, one of the hottest directors in Hollywood right now. He's already done a lot of movies or a number of movies where he has directed and starred in it. Like he did it with Argo, just won Best Picture of the Year at the Oscars. He did it with... Um, the town, which was fantastic. I love that movie. So clearly he can pull it off. There are a few guys who can. Uh, Clint Eastwood is obviously a guy who does that really well. And Ben Affleck is another. And there, there are a few others as well. But as somebody who's directed a film himself, I got to tell you, I have no idea how they pull it off. I, I just don't know how they pull it off. 
And I think it's probably closer to the second example you brought up where he acts the scene. Now he puts, he has a, an assistant director that I'm sure is there too. And he has the assistant director, like he tells the assistant director, this is what I want. Watch and make sure that's what we're getting and stop us and let me know if we're not getting that. And then he he shoots the scene, runs back, checks it out, frames it back up, gets back in front of the camera, back and forth. It, to me, it seems like insanity. So how guys like Clint Eastwood or Ben Affleck have pulled it off and pulled it off so successfully where they're not only directing amazing, they're also turning in amazing performances at the same time. That blows my mind. I, I, I simply don't know how it's done. And I think it, there's a reason that very few people do it. You see it happen every once in a while. Uh, Lake Bell just did it with um, In a World, that uh, movie about uh, trailer narrators. You know, the In a World, you know, that one. Uh, if you haven't seen In a World, directed by and starring Lake Bell, I think she might have wrote it too, I'm not sure. Uh, check it out, it's a really fun little film. I think you'll enjoy that. But I think there's a reason why you don't see it happening all the time. Because I gotta imagine it's next to impossible. Like I said, I directed a small little film and I can't, it was all consuming. It's completely all consuming. I just have no idea how you do it. I remember John Schnepp and I had this conversation once about that because, you know, John Schnepp is obviously a director, a much more established director, a better director than me. Um, and like, we were both like, I, I just, there's no way. How would you possibly do that? It just seems insane. So I have a feeling there's no one right way to do it, but I think I saw some things where Ben Affleck was doing what you were suggesting. He has his assistant director making sure Affleck's getting what he wants, and then Affleck is running back and forth behind the camera, in front of the camera, behind the camera to make sure everything's working out. And if it works for him, and clearly it does, kudos. Um, but it should also point out though, that while we were all presuming Ben Affleck is directing the next Batman film. Warner Brothers hasn't said that yet. Ben Affleck hasn't said that yet. So while we're all assuming it, let's just keep in mind that that is not official. Don't fall over of shock if we find out next month that, you know, they announced the standalone Batman movie and it's not Ben Affleck directing. Don't die of shock. I mean, I'll be surprised, but just don't die of shock because it's not official as of right now. Thanks a lot for the question, Richard. All right, let's move on to the next one. And the next one comes to us from Jesse Andrews, who writes... What if Fox announced Joss Whedon as the director for the Fantastic Four sequel? Could this revitalize the series? All right, well, thanks a lot for the question, Jesse. Um, you know, I think a year ago, that question would probably get a different answer from me than the one I'm going to give now. Remember, the answer I'm about to give is strictly my opinion. I mean, you may think differently, and there's nothing saying I'm right and you're wrong, so just take this for what it's worth. I think a year ago that question might have been answered a little differently than the way it'll be answered now. I think with Age of Ultron, which, by the way, I really enjoyed Avengers Age of Ultron. You know, the first time I saw it, I walked out wondering if I liked it as much as the first Avengers. And I think the first Avengers is the best comic book movie ever made. And I came out thinking, I think I liked it just as much, maybe even more. Now, then I thought about it for an hour or two and I was like, ah, oh, no, no, I'm probably not as good as the original Avengers, but still really good. And to this day, I still think Ultron was a really good, fun movie. Some people were very disappointed by it. As a matter of fact, there were enough dif people disappointed by it that it's kind of taken a little bit of the shine off Joss Whedon. I think undeservedly so, but let's call a spade a spade. There, there's a lot of perception out there that Age of Ultron and the ensuing kind of bitterness between Whedon and Disney and Marvel may have taken a little bit of the shine off of Joss Whedon from a public perception point of view. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is this, is when you're asking, could Whedon being involved with a Fantastic Four sequel, could that revitalize it? Well, it depends on how you're asking it. If you're asking, could it revitalize it as in the public will be interested in it again? I think it would give a little bit of a bump to Fantastic Four, if, if from public perception anyway, if you were to suddenly say that Joss Whedon was going to direct the next one. But let's not forget, we travel in very certain circles. You do if you watch a show like this and you travel in certain circles. I do because I do a show like this or I travel in certain circles where who is directing a film is very important to us and is a big deal to us. But we got to remember, there are a lot of people out there who never know who directs a movie. I, th I, think, I think you'll agree that the majority of the film going audiences out there are never even aware of who directs it nor do they care. I mean, maybe a name like Spielberg. 
maybe a name right now like Christopher Nolan, but I think for the most part, a lot of people, I, I think there are a lot of people out there who today still don't even know who Joss Whedon is. I kid you not. Um, not so long ago, we were holding auditions for, uh, for movie talk and we had a lot of hosts come in thousands of resumes and we had a lot of hosts come in and interview. And these are people who, who are, you know, they're plugged into media. They understand, they know media. They're not necessarily plugged into in the way we are all plugged in. And I think this was specifically when we were casting ultimately for when we cast uh, Sinead and how, how big did we score by landing Sinead to freeze. But a lot of people came in. There were so many of them. I, I formulated this one question. The first question I would ask people when they would come in was this question to see if they had any clue about our world. Because while I do not expect, you know, Ashley and Sinead are not film experts. They don't watch a ton of movies. All right. But that's okay because they're hosts. Hosting is hard. If you watched any of the episodes where I tried to do the hosting, you'll realize hosting's not easy. Sinead and Ashley do it way better than I would or anybody else in our crew would. And so they have a function on our show that they do best and they don't need to be film commentators. Now, that being said, I still wanted people who are at least a little bit plugged into our world or are aware of what the major issues in our world are. And I was getting a lot of people coming in auditioning for a host role. We probably interviewed about 100 people. And I finally came up with this one question that would be the first question I would ask. And here's the question I would ask. Do you know who Joss Whedon is? I kid you not. That was the first question I would ask. Do you know who Joss Whedon is? And if they said no, then I would simply go, you know what? He, he's kind of the king of the nerds right now. He's a major, major part of the world that we live in at the moment, in, in our little cinematic world that we live in. And I think if, you don't have to be a film expert, I, but I think if you're so detached from this world that we live in right now that you don't even know who Joss Whedon is, I don't think you're going to be a good fit for us. And we would end the interview right there. Fortunately, Sinead did know who Joss Whedon was. Fortunately, Ashley Mova did know who Joss Whedon was. Um, and we would go from there. But... That just shows that these, you know, when we get people who are, you know, training to be professional hosts in Hollywood, so they're at least somewhat plugged into the world of Hollywood and the world of film, and they understand at least a little bit of it, when they don't even know who Joss Whedon is, you got to at least acknowledge that there's probably a good chunk of the average movie going on, you know, the average people who see three, four films a year, maybe five films a year, that those people may not even know who Joss Whedon is. So from a public perception, I... I think adding a Joss Whedon may give it a bit of a bump, but not as big as you might think, considering I think a lot of people don't know who they are. I think a lot of people don't care who the director of a film is. And the fact that he's lost a little bit of his shine after Age of Ultron, even though to me he's still aces because I loved Age of Ultron, but that's just me. Now, from if you're asking could it revitalize the, fa the franchise of Fantastic Four from a quality point of view, it's hard to say because I still contend, I still believe they got a quality director for this Fantastic Four. But as everything came out about how they overly meddled, and believe, remember, I'm the type of guy who I believe a studio has a right to meddle, and I believe it's beneficial to a degree when studios meddle. But, they, but Fox crossed so many lines. You know, just having agreed to what this movie would be and then just days before production begins, come in and says, oh, three major action sequences, we're pulling those out. We're replacing the visual of your visual effects guy. We're changing art design. We're going to reshoot scenes without even telling you about Like, when they did that, that movie became doomed to fail. <laughs> no pun intended, doomed. Um, that movie became doomed to fail. I think Fox had a good, I mean, you watch uh, a movie like Chronicle. And the funny thing is, when you talk about the big weaknesses of Fantastic Four, no character development, no story flow, didn't care about the characters, all that kind of stuff. Well, then look at Chronicle. What did that movie really do well? Made us care about the made us care about the characters, gave us great story flow, made us made us invest in in some, gave depth to the characters, and got, you know, all the things that Chronicle did great were some things that were glaringly missing from Fantastic Four. So clearly there was a lot of interference from the studio. So if you bring in a Joss Whedon, I just don't have confidence that Fox wouldn't completely trounce on Joss Whedon too. 
Um, now, there are a few directors out there that Fox has shown they will not interfere with. They don't interfere with Brian Singer very much. They don't interfere with James Cameron very much. They don't interfere... Uh, well, there, there's a very small list, very small list of guys who, like Matthew Vaughn is, is another one of them, that they won't interfere too much with. And I think it would have to be one of those guys, honestly. So... I guess overall, my answer to be, I don't think adding uh, Joss Whedon would do much, either in terms of public perception, as far as revitalizing it goes, or quality, as far as revitalizing it goes, because I don't trust that Fox wouldn't do exactly to Joss Whedon what they just did to Josh Trank. So anyway, that's just my thought on it. I'd love to hear your opinion on it. Leave it in the comments section below. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Vat Vatla, who writes... I just became aware that Disney's live action version of The Jungle Book will open in IMAX theaters on April 15th, just three weeks after Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice and three weeks before Captain America Civil War. What gives? How come Disney signed a deal for Star Wars The Force Awakens to be screened in IMAX for four whole weeks, but Warner Brothers is only entitled to have Batman vs. Superman released in IMAX for three weeks? I really miss the good old days when I could enjoy a wonderful summer while The Dark Knight was playing in IMAX theaters for two whole months and I could watch it multiple times in that format back in 2008. Please, I'd love to know your thoughts on this. Well, thanks a lot for the question, uh, Vatla. Um, well, there's a couple things to, to keep in mind here. First of all, um, <laughs> asking the question... Why is Batman vs. Superman only entitled to three and Star Wars gets four? Why is it so unfair? I, okay, I, I think there's a little bit of fanboyism going on here, so let's just take a deep breath. The first thing to keep in mind is, while people like you and me, while you and I will together go hang out and we will go see a movie five or six times, three, four, five, six weeks after it's already been released... The vast, 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 vast majority of people do not. The, the First of all, the majority of people who see a movie see it in its opening week. The vast majority of people see it, a film in its first two weeks. And a ridiculous high percentage, at least 80% of people who see a movie, see a movie in its first three weeks. So three weeks on an IMAX screen is a pretty decent run. Um... Like if you really want to see it and you want to see it on IMAX, three weeks is plenty of time to get down there and watch it there. And there's no point in keeping a movie in that theater in week four, five, or six when the theater's going to be one quarter full. Um, so, I mean, that's just one way of looking at it. It's, it's not that big of a deal because it's just, it's the IMAX screen. I love IMAX. IMAX is great, but I'm going to love Batman versus Superman just as much watching it on a regular movie screen as well. Don't get me wrong. If I have the option, I'll see it IMAX, but it's not the biggest deal in the world. But the biggest thing here is that uh, there's nothing unfair going on. It's like, why does Batman versus Superman only get three weeks and Star Wars gets four? That's unfair. No, it's not unfair. Um, because Batman vs. Superman is going to be released in a much more crowded time frame. When IMAX has obligations to other films. And it's like, okay, Batman vs. Superman, you want that fourth week? You want us to say no to Jungle Book? Pay us this. Well, that's unreasonable. Jungle Book, trust me, is an IMAX movie. That's going to be a movie you will want to see on IMAX. And they know that a lot more people will go into the theater to watch Jungle Book on its opening weekend in an IMAX theater than will be going to IMAX to watch Batman vs. Superman in its fourth week. It's just business sense. So why does Star Wars get um, why does Star Wars get four weeks? Well, let's take a second and look at that. What is opening against Star Wars? Well, there's that comedy with Amy Poehler and Tina Fey called Sisters. I think it's opening on the same weekend. We call that counter-programming. That's fine. But Sisters wasn't going to be an IMAX screen anyway. The following week, you got Alvin and the Chipmunks. That ain't going to be... That's not an IMAX movie. You got Concussion. That's not an IMAX movie. You got the Will Ferrell, Mark Wahlberg comedy, Daddy's Home. That's not an IMAX movie. You got Point Break. That's not an IMAX movie. You got Snowden. That's not an IMAX movie. Okay, let's go to the following week. We're in January now. 
We got a new horror from Blumhouse. That, that's not a, a, an IMAX movie. Let's go to the to the following week now. We got Benghazi. That's not an IMAX movie. You got The Nut Job 2. That's not an IMAX movie. You got Ride Along 2. That's not an IMAX movie. Okay, let's go to the next week then. Now we're all the way up to January 22nd. What do we got? We got that horror movie, The Boy. That's not an IMAX movie. You got Dirty Grandpa. That's not an IMAX movie. You got Risen. That's not an IMAX movie. And then you've got London Fallen. London is Fallen. That might, might be an IMAX film, but I wouldn't be going to an IMAX. I wouldn't be lining up paying a premium ticket price to see London has fallen on an IMAX screen. I'm going to be just happy to see that on a regular screen. So I'm gonna see, now we're all the way up to January 29th. We got the finest hours, not an IMAX screen. Uh, we got a little horror film coming from New Line that's not an IMAX worthy movie. And then you got Kung Fu Panda 3. Depending on if that's 3D, all that kind of stuff, that is a movie that you could argue, say, okay, that one's you're probably want an IMAX. Kung Fu Pick is lots of action, very colorful, blah, blah, blah. But that's January 29th. That's like five weeks later, five or six weeks later. So you're asking, why can Star Wars get four weeks and Batman vs. Superman only gets three? Because there's nothing opening in the immediate weeks after Star Wars that would deserve a place or need a place on an IMAX screen. Batman vs. Superman is opening during a time when three weeks later you've got The Jungle Book, which is going to be a big tentpole film. Look, Jungle Book is not going to make as much money as Batman vs. Superman. But as I said earlier, that week that Jungle Book opens, a lot more people will go into an IMAX screen to watch The Jungle Book on its opening weekend in IMAX than would be going out to watch it in an IMAX screen on Batman vs. Superman's fourth week. It's just business. It's just math. Um... So IMAX would only had three weeks available for Batman versus Superman, and that's what's taken. And honestly, like I said before, personally, I think three weeks is plenty of time. I will have seen it on an IMAX screen three or four times by that point, and then I can just watch it in regular theaters, and it'll be just as good. So yeah, so anyway, that's my personal opinion on that. Thank you so much for writing in the question. Let's move on now to question number five. And the fifth question today comes to us from Polly Sarah, who writes... I love you guys so much. Well, thank you, Polly. We love you too. Huge fan. Why is it that James Cameron is seldom re referenced along with the other great directors of our time? I've heard people on this show refer to Ben Affleck as one of the greats. Well, uh, to be fair, he's one of the greats right now. Uh, none of us over here are calling Ben Affleck one of the all-time greats. But any anyway, let's get back to your question. Um, and those are two very good movies, but not Cameron's caliber. He's raked in huge truckloads of money with Avatar, uh, Terminator 2, Titanic, Abyss, True Lies, Aliens. James created technology so that he may shoot Avatar. The guy has also launched careers from the above movies to like Schwarzenegger and DiCaprio. So John, what's your thoughts? Is he up there with Coppola, Scorsese, and Spielberg? Um, well, no, no. James Cameron is not up there with, uh, I mean, he's a great director. But is he up there with Scorsese, Coppola, and Spielberg? No, no, no. Um, and, and he did not launch the careers of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger was already Arnold Schwarzenegger before Terminator. Uh, I mean, it, it was certainly one of the pinnacles, one of the big uh, milestones of his career, absolutely. Um, he did not launch the career of Leonardo DiCaprio. But, you know, they figured prominently Leonardo DiCaprio was already on the cover of every teen magazine all that kind of stuff he was a big star before he was ever in Titanic still that being said James Cameron's directed my all-time favorite action film to this day my all-time favorite action film is True Lies I think that is an underappreciated film I think that is a genius movie frankly it's my favorite James Cameron film um I, I think it's just fantastic um but here's the thing James Cameron is clearly a great director, and we should be excited whenever he has a new movie coming out. But to put him on Mount Olympus with guys like Spielberg or Scorsese, directors who each have multiple films that are better than anything James Cameron has done. James Cameron has not made a film anywhere near the quality of The Godfather. All right? he James Cameron... 99.9999, no other director has made a movie. Like, it's almost an unfair comparison. How, how, it's not fair to compare a director's movie to Francis Ford Coppola's The Godfather. That's completely unfair, but that is the question you are raising. 
Should Cameron be considered on that level? And the answer, I personally, this is just my personal opinion, is no. Cameron has never made a film as good as The Godfather. Cameron has never made a film as good as Godfather Part Two. And there are some people out there who would who would make the argument, not me personally, but there are some people out there who would argue that James Cameron has never made a film as good as Apocalypse Now. I mean, a lot of us forget about Apocalypse Now. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, Avatar was great. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. Did not deserve to win Best Picture, and it didn't win Best Picture. Um, Titanic was really good, and it made lots of money, uh, but money doesn't equal quality, per se. True Lies, I think best action film of all time. I love True Lies. I'll always love True Lies. What he did with Terminator is amazing. Um, but, you know, I don't think you put him up there with Coppola. I think he's more consistent than Coppola. I, I'll give him that. I think he's more consistent than Coppola. But if you just, just look at those three films by Coppola, I, I don't know that Cameron's made a single film that is as good as any of those three. Godfather, Godfather Part Two, uh, Apocalypse Now. Let's look at uh, Martin Scorsese. I, I, you know, whether his films, Wolf of Wall Street, Hugo, The Departed, Raging Bull, uh, Gangs of New York, Casino, Goodfellas, um, The Aviator, um, on and on and on. There are going to be a lot of cinephiles who will, who will make an argument. I'm not necessarily saying I'm one of them, but there are a lot of cinephiles out there who make an argument that there are multiple films on that list that are better than anything James Cameron's ever done. That James Cameron doesn't, if, if you put James Cameron's films together with Martin Scorsese's, none of the James Cameron's films come in the top three or four. It's all going to be Martin Scorsese films. And if they're all Martin Scorsese films, can you say that James Cameron ranks up there, deserves to be in that conversation with a Martin Scorsese? Then you look at a guy like Steven Spielberg, who I personally feel is the greatest director of all time. We're talking about Jaws, E.T., Saving Private Ryan, Schindler's List, uh, the Indiana Jones films, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Amistad, his most underrated film, Amistad. I actually think it might be Spielberg's best film. But anyway, Minority Report, Catch Me If You Can, um, on and on and on and on. Spielberg's done it all. He's done it all. And there are many cinephiles who may make an argument that, again, if you put James Cameron films together with Steven Spielberg's film, no Cameron films will appear in the number one, two, three, or four spots. Some will, will say they will. That's totally cool. Some will say they won't, which is also totally cool. So I think James Cameron, and by the way, Ben Affleck does not belong up in that conversation either um, at all. Uh, not yet. Give him 15 more years. Let's see where he's at. But I think it is safe to say that James Cameron definitely is near the top of that next level, that next level down of, of, you know, the great directors of all time. But, you know, we often talk in terms of the Mount Rushmore of directors. Does a James Cameron belong on the Mount Rushmore of directors? Um, like, does he belong up there with a Kubrick? Does he belong up there with a Coppola, with a Scorsese, with a Spielberg, with an Alfred Hitchcock? Um, does he belong up there with those guys? And I'm going to say there's a possibility that by the time he's done, and he's got a lot of years ahead of him, that by the time he's done, maybe he gets in that conversation. But right now, I, it's just, no, he's way up there. He's just not on that Mount Rushmore. That's just my opinion. It's all subjective. Clearly, you have a different thought on that. Leave your thoughts in the comments section below and let me know what you guys think. Do you think James Cameron, as great as he is, do you think he deserves to be in that conversation, in that fellowship of a Scorsese, of a Spielberg, of a Stanley Kubrick, of a, of a, of a Francis Ford Coppola? Do you believe he belongs in that conversation yet? Let me know your thoughts. It'll be interesting to see what you guys think. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from David King, who writes, I just wanted to know your thoughts on TV episodes being shown at movie theaters. For example, in 2013, the 50th anniversary of Doctor Who was in movie theaters across the world. This happened again last year when it was the first episode of Doctor Who season eight and was also shown in some movie theaters. So I just wanted to know, what do they, um, why do they do it? And why people even go to see something at a movie theater they could just watch on their TVs for free. I would love to know your thoughts on this. Love the show. Keep up the great work. Well, thanks a lot for the question, David. Um, I, I love it, to be honest, when there's a big event that I can go and watch on a movie theater. Why? Because I've said this before. I will say it again. Nothing. Nothing beats 
the movie theater experience. Nothing matches it. Nothing tops it. I got a great home theater system, um, small by some standards, but I got a 60 inch, beautiful display in my living room. I got a great speaker system, wonderful home theater system with recliners and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, doesn't matter. Nothing beats the movie going experience. You will never get a picture as good. You will never get sound as good, but that's almost side notes. The real thing to me, the movie going experience, the event of it is being in a room filled with other fans and laughing together with all these strangers laughing together, gasping together, jumping together, cheering together, shaking together. You know, nothing beats it. This is a song I have been singing for 15 years. Nothing beats the movie going experience. And then when you can get a special television experience, um, you know, there, there are certain uh, series that I, th I think Breaking Bad should have done aired their series finale um, on in theaters and on television at the same time. And I guarantee you, they would have sold out a lot of theaters. Why? Yes, we could have just watched it at home. But the movie going experience, the movie theater experience, remember, I don't work for AMC theaters anymore, so whatever, screw them. But I'm telling you, nothing beats the movie going experience. It's an event. It feels like something special. I love going to the movies to this day. I mean, I go to so many movies, doesn't matter. I, every day I know I'm going to the movie theater to me is a good day. I love it. I love going there. I love the smell of popcorn in the air. I love taking my seats. I love having strangers around me all excited to see the movie at the same time. I mean, nothing beats it. And when you get a special television uh, event, that you can put that and also wrap that into the movie going experience with a television event. That's great too. Um, I know I've gone to see uh, UFC events in a movie theater because it's great being surrounded by all these people at the same time. Nothing beats the movie going experience. Um, it will always be superior to watching at home. Now, look, maybe you're one of these types of people and this is totally cool that you like being alone. You like it being in your quiet living room solitude, peace and quiet. You're comfortable. You've got your own food that you've prepared. You've got your own bottle of wine or whatever it is. You're in your favorite pajamas, silk pajamas, all cozy and snug. And it's just a really comfortable, enjoyable experience for you to be at home doing that. And so you're different from me. And that's great too. Nothing wrong with that. That's awesome. But I'm just saying for me, and I think a lot of people like me, I just think nothing touches the movie going experience and I don't think anything ever will touch it. That's just my opinion, but that's why I think idiots like me, if you know, for instance, supernatural is one of my favorite is uh, maybe my favorite show on TV right now. Um, if they do the season finale in a movie theater, I'm going to go to the movie theater to watch it, even though I could just watch it at home. That's because I just love the experience. Anyway, thanks a lot for the question, man. Let's move on to the next one. And the next question comes to us from Ashley Arnold, who writes, Hey, Collider guys and gals, I love the show. My question is regarding press screenings versus opening night. I was just wondering if there is any film that you have watched or is coming out that you would rather see on a packed out opening night than a press screening. For example, Star Wars. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Ashley. And yeah, I've done this before. Um... One of the big examples of this was uh, Man of Steel. I was so psyched for Man of Steel. There, there was just something about it that to me, I turned down the press screenings because I wanted, for whatever reason, I wanted my first experience watching Man of Steel to be with a full movie theater of ticket buying fans. That's who I wanted to see the opening night of Man of Steel with. And that's what I did. And I loved it. But I don't do it often. And quite frankly, my job doesn't really afford me the luxury of putting off seeing films to watch them opening night because we got to have reviews ready or I have to have commentary ready, whatever. Um, but, now, but then there are some movies, like for instance, Avengers of Age of Ultron. I, I didn't wait to see that with a with the regular group. Why? Because I knew all of my colleagues in the online movie world who were also going to be going to these press screenings, they were just as big as fans as anybody else that was going to be in the movie theater on opening night. 
And I knew we were going to have fun because I remember the first press screening I saw of the first Avengers movie, it was all online press. It was all movie press. It was all film critics and stuff like that. And it was a party. We all lost our minds. We were hooting and hollering and cheering and yelling and screaming. And it was just a great time. And so the when Star Wars comes up, and any of you guys know who have been watching me for any period of time, you know Star Wars is my life. Um, Star Wars is one of those films that theoretically I would love to say, yeah, I'm going to wait for opening night with an audience. But the reality is I would never be able to hold out and wait. I would never be able to hold out and wait. Um, I'm going to get invited to an advanced screening and there is just no way in the world that I'm going to be able to say no to that. But I also don't think I'm going to need to say no to that because like that first Avengers screening, I thought, I think a lot of my online and uh, film commentary and film critic brethren and, and sisterin, what is the feminine thing of brethren? Sisterin? That doesn't sound right. Anyway, correct my grammar. Um, my brothers and sisters in the, in the film community, I think they are just as excited or almost at least as excited for the new Star Wars as me. And I think when I go to that first press screening of Star Wars, I think it's going to be just like that first press screening of Avengers. I think it's going to be like opening night with a regular audience. I think we're all going to be hooting and hollering and cheering and screaming. And I think I'm going to get that experience anyway. So yes, every once in a while, there is a movie that comes along that I'd like to just wait and see with, a, with an audience. Um... But I don't get to do that often because of my job. And sometimes when it's a movie like Avengers or it's a movie like Star Wars, I don't need to because us film critics who are, you know, and, and film commentators and whatever, who are a crotchety old bunch, we get just as excited as anybody else. So there's that. All right, let's move on to the last question of the day. And the last question today comes to us from Carl. And Carl writes, I would like you to take a trip down memory lane to the 2006 Oscars when Crash surprisingly won the award for Best Picture. I have always argued that Brokeback Mountain was denied the award because the Academy was terrified that there would be a backlash against them from certain conservative elements in the U.S. government or, or general public. Only a month previously, it had won the Best Picture Award at the BAFTAs, the U.K. Academy Awards, basically, with no fuss. I would like to hear your opinions on the matter. Um, well, thanks a lot, man. And, you know, over the years, I, I have heard this argument a lot. That, uh, oh, from certain people at any rate, say, oh, Brokeback Mountain just didn't win because, you know, Hollywood wanted to be politically correct and all this kind of stuff. I, I got to tell you, I flatly reject that. I flatly reject that. Since when is Hollywood accused of being too politically correct? Hollywood is the most liberal place in the world. Um, and I'm going to tell you right now, why did Brokeback Ma Broke Mountain not win Best Picture? Because it didn't deserve to. I've been saying that since 2006. Brokeback Mountain did not deserve to win Best Picture. Um, I do think... Now, I also don't think Crash should have won, but I would have given it to Crash before Brokeback Mountain. But the movie I really think should have won, I think Good Night and Good Luck should have won Best Picture that year. I think... So I would have had at least two films ahead of Brokeback Mountain. But this... That's just me personally. It's, it's completely subjective. But... Here's the thing, this, this argument that these excuses that people come up with, I, I just don't, never, like I said, if this was the Fox movie awards and Fox didn't give it to Brokeback Mountain, maybe then you, there, I still don't think it deserved to win, but maybe then you'd have some argument, well, Fox was just being biased, Fox being the incredibly right-wing thing, but um, this was the Hollywood, man. This is the Academy Awards. And remember, this is the same body. This is the same year to say, oh, you know, Hollywood's afraid of the right wing. Well, they nominated Brokeback Mountain for Best Picture. The Ang Lee, the director of the film, won Best Director. You know who won Best Actor that year? Philip Seymour Hoffman playing Capote, a gay character. You know who was nominated? for Best Actress that year, uh, Felicity Huffman for Transamerica. Same year. Um, Heath Ledger was nominated for Best Actor. Jake Gyllenhaal was nominated for Best Supporting Actor. The Academy Awards had no problem lifting up and celebrating the gay community in that year's Oscars. But, but it didn't win the big one. Sorry, it didn't deserve to win the big one. 
Not because it had gay themes, because it wasn't the best movie of the year. Deal with it. Now, that this, now saying that, you may think it was the best movie of the year, and I may think it wasn't. It's, it's all subjective. But it's not such a slam dunk. You can only make that argument if it was a clear slam dunk where everybody else thought, you know, in all of our subjective opinions, everybody else thought it was the best film of the year. But that's not the case. There were a lot of people who thought Crash should have won. There were a lot of people who, like me who thought Good Night and Good Luck should have won the Academy Award that year. There were a lot of people out there who didn't think, based on the merits of a movie, that Brokeback Mountain deserved to win. There's just too many of us that didn't feel that Brokeback Mountain deserved to win. And I, so when these excuse arguments come out, Oh, it just didn't get it because it was gay themes. I'm sorry, but all the evidence points to the contrary. I mean, that, that particular Academy Awards was a celebration of acceptance. It was a celebration of diversity. Every single category either had a winner or nominees from the gay community. I mean, Hollywood is, who accuses Hollywood of being too right wing? <laughs> anyway, so that's just my thing. I, I, like I said, from a pure movie perspective, I never felt Brokeback Mountain deserved to win. I think there's too much evidence of Hollywood celebrating um, the gay community and diversity and stuff like that at that year's particular Academy Awards to even suggest, oh, that, well, if that, well then why did they give Best Director to Ang Lee? If they were really worried about celebrating a gay theme movie, why did they give Best Director to Ang Lee? Why did they nominate as one of the best performances of the year Felicity Huffman in Transamerica? Why, you know, did they give the Academy Award to an actor portraying a gay character in Capote? Because there was no bias that year. So, like I said, just that's just my personal opinion. You may feel totally differently. Your opinion is every bit as valid as mine, but I just got to say from my point of view, the reason Brokeback Mountain didn't win the Academy Award for Best Picture it was because it did not deserve to win uh, the Academy Award for Best Picture strictly based on the merits of how good of a movie it was. Nothing to do with the themes. Anyway, That'll do it for me, guys, for this installment of uh, Collider Mailbag. Thanks so much for joining me and tolerating me uh, these past 45 minutes or so. Listen, don't forget, lots of great movies are playing out our friend over at AMC Theaters. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com to check out all the theater showtime and, of course, movie ticket information. We are so glad to have AMC Theaters as one of the sponsors of the shows that we do here. But most importantly, guys, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button. Become one of our subscribers. Almost 120,000 other people have. You should too. Keeping you up to date on all the videos that we do here at Collider Video. And uh, just as a personal plug, don't forget my new novel, my first novel, called The Pride uh, is coming out in a few months. I am still running my Kickstarter campaign uh, to raise funds to do put all the polish on it that a real professional book should have so I don't shortchange you guys for what's going on. I am not a Hollywood millionaire that can just pay for everything himself because um, you guys have probably heard me talk about like I hate I hate it when Hollywood millionaires use Kickstarter. Um, for their projects when it should be for guys like John Schnepp or other people who have these creative visions to that. So anyway, I started a Kickstarter myself. You guys have already helped me hit my goal. I'm now going for my stretch goals to get a professionally uh, produced audiobook. So just go over to kickstarter.com and search for The Pride and you will find my uh, you'll find my novel there and how you can reserve your advanced copy and contribute to the project as well. And I thank you so much for your support. So that do it for me guys. For Collider Video, my name is John Camp Thanks so much for joining me and until next time, bye-bye.